Uh, welcome to this month's Sawal Jawab session. Today we have three scientists with us who would be discussing this year's Nobel Prizes. Before we begin, you are requested to type your questions on the live chat box on YouTube. We will be taking questions after each talk. Coming to today's series of talks, the first talk is by Krishnan Harshan. He is a principal scientist at CCMB and specializes in the field of molecular virology. Today, he's going to discuss how Harvey J. Alter, Michael Houghton, and Charles M. Rice discovered the hepatitis C virus. He's also going to tell us about the impact of their work on public health. So with that, I'd like to request Krishnan to begin his talk. Thanks, uh, thanks Anishila. Um, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. It's also a privilege for me to be speaking here interesting a large audience on the impact of uh, studies by three scientists that kind of revolutionized uh, uh, the, the field of uh, human health over the last 30 years or so. Okay, so um, I'm a research scientist at CCMB and I've been working on uh, molecular virology for several years now. I have a group at CCMB that works on hepatitis C virus uh, in addition to other viruses such as uh, um, dengue and corona. Okay, so um, hepatitis C virus has been a major part of our research and I will take you through um, some of the aspects of um, the hepatitis C virus research that these three scientists were able to, um, you know, uh, contribute and then change our, our, our health. So I'm going to share the um, slide now. I hope it's uh, uh, visible to all of you. Okay. So um, this was truly uh, taming a deadly viral pathogen that the story is uh, about. And these three people, these three scientists uh, with completely different backgrounds, they contributed to this you know, at multiple stages uh, of, of making this uh, uh, the, the, the research a successful one and uh, started with Harvey J. Alter and then subsequently contributed significantly by Michael Hoffman with uh, molecular uh, biology tools and then subsequently the last one, uh, last phase of this uh, entire journey was completed by Charles Rice. So they were essentially uh, uh, you know, awarded a uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology uh, or medicine in 2020 for their contribution to efforts in finding out the root cause for a major chronic hepatitis and developing reagents that led to the discovery of the cure. Right? Now, if you look at uh, uh, historically, uh, several viruses, discovery of uh, 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 you know, several viruses or extensive work on several viruses have been awarded uh, Nobel Prizes uh, over a period of time, starting from 1954. Um, when um, John Franklin Enders and others uh, co discovered poliomyelitis virus, which changed the, uh, you know, our understanding about polio virus and also uh, was able to completely eliminate polio from a majority of the population. And then subsequently in 1965, um, uh, Jacob and Monod, all of you guys know, they're extensively, extensively worked on bacteriophages. And uh, Rouse actually worked and identified Rouse sarcoma virus, which was the first uh, oncovirus to be identified. And subsequently, Delbrook, Hershey, and Luria were uh, given um, Nobel Prize for um, you know identifying uh, genetic structure of the virus. And then subsequently, David Baltimore and uh, Temin, and, and of course also Dubeko, for identifying the transformation by tumor viruses. And in 1976. Um, this B discovery was given Nobel Prize to Baruch Bloomberg, and then we know uh, in 2008, um, three scientists were actually given, I mean, in fact, two scientists were uh, given Nobel Prize for identifying uh, HIV. So now in 2020, uh, we have the next set of virologists who were awarded Nobel Prize for uh, another virus, which is called CB, that is C virus. So it's, a, it's an RNA uh, virus and uh, it is classified under flavivirid family where you would also find similar viruses such as uh, dengue and West Nile viruses. And one thing that uh, people do not really appreciate that it has already uh, infected about 170 million people worldwide and had the potential to infect a much, much larger population if there was no proper 
uh, uh, you know, discoveries and uh, and development was not done. In fact, the number, if you look at it, is much more than that is contributed by HIV and MTB. So the, the number is actually very staggering. And essentially, the, the virus HCV spreads through uh, blood or other body parts. And, and you know, you can imagine that uh, anything blood transfusion or you know organ transplantation, and also injectable drug users. I mean, you would actually see that spreading, and that's exactly what happened. And it's been implicated in development of liver fibrosis, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma in, 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 in a large majority of the infected people. And the most difficult part is that it has got two, six different genotypes. A seventh one is also proposed, but then that makes the treatment and, and the therapy difficult. And uh, currently, there is no vaccine available for it. Okay. So, but um, the, the contribution by these researchers have actually contributed, I mean, led to a substantial drop in the number uh, from about 170 million to about uh, 70 million currently. Uh, and it's still still uh, around 400,000 people die every year because of HCV related diseases and 1.75 million new infections are reported every year. That means even with, uh, with improved drug therapy and other things, you would still find a lot of new infections happening and specifically in countries where there is no uh, you know, uh, surveillance of, or blood screening in the, in the transfusion cases or also uh, in, in injectable uh, uh, drug users. Uh, hepatitis C virus is a very small virus, which would essentially be about 50 nanometer in diameter. All it has got uh, is, 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 is a, a RNA genetic material inside a capsid, which is enveloped. And this is uh, a, 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 a hepatotropic. That means that it is it loves uh, liver cells of the humans. It's very specific to humans as well, but it also can infect chimpanzee and some of the uh, 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 monkeys. Now, if you look at the genome of hepatitis C virus, it's a small genome, as I said, in terms of otherwise, in comparison with several other viruses, about 10 kilobits, one single stranded RNA, which is per standard, and then maybe one single polypeptide, which is subsequently cleaved and made about 10 proteins. That's all. And with, the, with this repertoire of about 10 proteins, the virus is able to um, you know, uh, cause such a, such a big problem in human beings. And the virus enters the cells through endocytosis and it forms, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it associates with cholesterol on the outside, and that is actually very important for the virus to be, be infectious. Now, when I come back to this uh, viral hepatitis, as the name indicates, the, the meaning of hepatitis is inflammation of liver, and you can have literally two different types of hepatitis, which is either acute or chronic. And people have actually currently identified that there are five different uh, viruses that can cause hepatitis, starting from hepatitis A to E, uh, of which A and E have been shown to be, uh, uh, you know, spread mostly through water or food. And hepatitis D virus, which is Delta virus, is actually not directly causing any disease. It actually uh, helps hepatitis D virus to uh, make this, uh, you know, the the the, the, the symptom uh, very severe. And of and then, uh, as you see, hepatitis uh, D and C are chronic viruses, and both of which actually spread through blood or uh, you know body fluids, right? So. Um, for in terms of uh, therapy, I mean, there's no vaccine available for AIDS hepatitis C virus because of the complexity of its 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 its, its uh, you know its diversity as well as the ability of the virus to mutate constantly. But fortunately, with uh, the discovery of several uh, inhibitors, polymerase uh, in, um, NSYO polymerase inhibitors, uh, N, uh, NSYB polymerase inhibitors, and protease inhibitors, in the advent of these inhibitors, there has been beautiful therapy, and uh, you know over 95% of the cases can actually be treated. Um, so this, when you, when, you, when you reach at this stage where there is a, even though there is not a vaccine, but a very effective um, drugs are available to uh, limit or uh, you know, prevent the replication of the virus and then give the person a happy rest of the life, that's actually a remarkable change. And that's precisely what these people were, uh, you know, uh, appreciated for. Now, I will start with the, uh, how this discovery actually unfolded. So when Harvey Alter, who was actually a physician and had been uh, working with an, uh, NIH for several years, since 1960s or something, he was also uh, involved with the identification of the discovery of hepatitis B virus. Okay, so uh, he kind of knew in that field, uh, you know, he, he, he really loved liver and liver associated things. So he had been working on several of these hepatitis and then they consistently noticed even after the, after the discovery of uh, hepatitis B virus, um, which happened in the late uh, you know, 1960s, they realized that 
Um, so what what changed with hepatitis B virus is that there was a, there was a, now a serology test with which they can actually screen the blood of the people who donate blood or even uh, you know organs. So they could identify that this is a virus, and then that actually took away about thirty percent of the uh, of the loads of the, of, the, of, the, of the infection cases. Now until then, this uh, uh, you know transfusion associated hepatitis was actually a big problem. And people could easily associate that to be more of a contagious than something something else. So now uh, the discovery of uh, hepatitis B actually was a big relief. But in spite of its discovery, um, you know, several cases of uh, trans, uh, trans, uh, trans uh, you know, uh, transfusion associated hepatitis kind of kept on kept on uh, going up. Now that actually put them uh, in in a puzzle. And then uh, Harvey had been working on it for a long time, and he really knew uh, in and out of hepatitis. Uh, B, and then by the middle of around around say about 1975 or something, um, they actually I mean another group actually identified hepatitis A virus. So, uh, but then interestingly, when they were looking at uh, you know the the transfusion associated you know uh, viruses, hepatitis A virus uh, you know antigens could not be picked up. So that kind of ruled out um, uh, you know the, the 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 contribution of hepatitis A virus. In, from the chronically infected or uh, transfusion associated cases. Now, so that in, in spite of, uh, you know, screening out both hepatitis A and B uh, cases, the, the, the transfusion associated hepatitis was actually ongoing. And that gave rise to the thought that there is yet another unidentified, you know, uh, factor. even at that point of time, they had no clue that this, this could be a virus. So they coined this term called non-A, non-B hepatitis virus, even though they, they had several uh, you know, reasons to believe that this is infectious until uh, they put chimpanzees into the studies they couldn't prove. So how chimpanzees revolution, uh, you know, use of chimpanzees revolutionized the field was, now could actually take out these blood samples from which uh, you screen out hepatitis, uh, you know, A, um, A and B virus cases, and then whatever is left, non-NA, uh, NBH samples, they, they put into chimpanzee, they inject it into chimpanzee. And very interestingly, chimpanzee developed uh, symptoms similar to what uh, patients uh, found in humans, and that gave uh, quite a lot of uh, you know you know uh, you know strength to the study and also confidence for carrying out uh, for the studies. Now, with the help of these chimpanzees, they could actually show that this is something contagious and that is actually transmitted from through uh, through the blood. Now, even though this, this discovery happened in around 1975 and a lot of studies actually were being carried out in chimpanzees, they couldn't actually come out, they couldn't identify that the, it, it's actually a virus. And you know, that's primarily because there was no serology test available for this. And they, nobody could actually find out a factor or an antigen that was exclusively present in the infected cases, not present in, 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 the, in, the, in the healthy persons. So that had been a major roadblock. Right, so until about 1989, there was no, I mean, there was progress happening and this, they could actually convince the people that this is a factor non-hepatitis uh, non, uh, non B. But then this, uh, this pathogen was never identified until uh, Michael Houghton, who was working in an in a, in a, in a, in a, in industry, Cairn Corporation, for several years. So uh, this uh, <coughs> corporation was funding several studies at that time in 1980s and all, and then Michael Houghton was a premier scientist in that. And he also had been working on several molecular biology tools, right? Uh, so they had several groups, and then he had been trying um, independently to um, identify certain factors or get clones uh, that would actually express certain factors that contributes to or is responsible for this NANBH. Right. So, in, primarily what they have been trying was, they were trying to generate this cDNA expression libraries uh, with the hope that at least some of these clones could actually express certain factors coming out of the, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, you know, of uh, pathogen or the bug responsible causing NANBH. But uh, please remember this, please note that at that point of time, they had no clue that this is a virus. I mean, they had certainly some indications, but there was no evidence for it. Forget about the clue that it was also an RNA virus. So irrespective of that, they were expecting that if this is a pathogen driven thing, they should express specific mRNAs and that should be, you know, we, we are able to capture that, we should be able to express some. And then subsequently we could develop a serology testing. So that was a, that was a drive that on which they were actually, actually working. <coughs> 
after several rounds of failures and multiple uh, different kinds of uh, approaches finally they were able to uh, they, they hit the jackpot right and uh, if you look at this this is pretty much what they did they used the uh, you know samples from chimpanzee infected with this uh, sample from patients and they created cdna libraries in bacteria remember there was also luck in that so because they were actually using cdna libraries in bacteria to express this factor and fortunately, one clone, 511, that they cloned, that actually picked up the signal when antibodies, uh, again, from the patients were uh, tested. And that gave the first clue that, okay, that gave the hint of the first, the first time a factor that is not associated with the host, but associated with something outside, and that could be a potential pathogen. And then they subsequently refined their uh, technique and then finally identified multiple clones and then developed serology tests uh, for against this, and that kind of really, really revolutionized the field because here you have a system to screen blood again, right? So imagine that they took about 15 years from the original hypothesis that it is actually uh, 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 a virus that is, uh, you know, different from hepatitis B. And this again was a very, very revolutionary, revolutionary work. And then he and uh, Harvey started collaborating in confirming that through uh, you know, samples from multiple chimpanzees and also patients, really, really uh, strengthening their data, confirming that this is indeed a new pathogen that they have done. And then subsequently, they uh, also uh, went back and then uh, you know, identified that this is the, the, the pathogen has RNA as the genome, and also were able to show that this is about 10 kilobits in length. So this study was certainly, certainly uh, one of the most revolutionary studies after the initial discovery of the known known right? Now, uh, so a lot of people actually started working on it, but then they were also trying to uh, they were also trying to set up systems um, to culture the virus. Now, one of the primary things uh, in virology is to be able to culture a virus from a patient. For example, that now we have coronavirus in our laboratory. Uh, generated from the samples, nasopharyngeal samples. Um, so we we were fortunate that we already had some clue about how to do it from earlier work. And we also had the tools to do that. Right? That means we need to have right permissive cell lines to do, in which the virus should also grow. And unfortunately, this was not true for hepatitis C virus. No matter whatever you try, people, several people in different, different labs across the world tried uh, getting the patient samples, uh, which had tons of viruses in them. But then they would infect human hepatocytes or hepatoma cell lines, they would never get a, a system where the virus would actually replicate. And in the absence of a, of, of a system where, where the virus replicates, you are never going to be able to understand the life cycle of the virus, and you are now going to be able to understand uh, you know, you know, the, the functions of viral proteins, and you're also not going to be able to uh, have, a, have a cell in vitro system against which potential drugs can be right. And that's when Charles, Charles Rice, Rice, who was working at Rockefeller, uh, actually contributed. So, uh, like several others, and he, his laboratory was also trying to set up the cell culture system. And he happened to be, I mean, certainly he, he happened to be lucky because um, uh, he happened to also have a cell line <coughs> which allowed the replication of the virus. Right? That means this, this particular cell line had a very low anti, innate antiviral response. And this happened to be his complete serendipity. But what he did was he was able to uh, clone the entire XCV genome into a plasmid and then, uh, you know, make an infectious clone from which you could actually make viral RNA by in vitro transcription, use that, uh, introduce that into the cells to make more and more virus. So here two things actually uh, came together. The system that he developed, the plasmid based system, and he was also lucky to have a right cell line in his hand, which happened to accommodate the virus. And also, the genome that he cloned also had certain cell culture adaptation mutant. That was another point that also happened to be lucky. Right? Now, uh, so wh whatever it is, the, the hard work and the luck actually played a big role. And once this, this was actually developed only in uh, 2005. So remember this 1975 to 1989 dry period. And from 1989, when HCV was identified until 2005, there was no way that people could actually look at the life cycle of the virus. Now here you have a system with the help of Charlie Rice and subsequently now several other people also reported uh, 
um, um, you know, successful uh, replication of, of SCP in, in, in cells. So these revolutionize the field like again, because now you could actually study the, the, the roles of several viral proteins and uh, could specifically target each of them. Because now you have a system, you can infect cells with the virus that are grown in the culture, now come back with potential drugs and see if they inhibit the viral growth. And this actually in the next, in the, about next four, five, five to six years, a lot of actually development happened in academy as well as in industry and that resulted in the development of several very, very efficient direct acting antivirals as listed here. And now currently a combination of several of these is what is used by the physicians. And uh, you know, in, in a matter of about two, three years, I mean, it was uh, originally approved by FDA in, in 2016 or something. And you already start seeing a lot of change in the field because I, 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 I personally know several people who have now recovered from HCV, which used to be a very, very extremely rare case until this was introduced. So the, the fate of these people was kind, kind of you know, guaranteed that you know, they are going to develop either fibrosis or cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma, which were, all of them could be fatal. Now you have a combination of drugs that are very effective against the virus. Unfortunately, I mean, that was a fortunate side of it. Unfortunately, these drugs also kind of completely killed the field of HCV research because now you have very efficient drugs and there is no more interest in studying uh, the, the, the biology of the virus because it's in control, right? That's on the flip side. Now, anyway, so the contribution of these people is a wonderful, wonderful story. You know, this is like a, it's, a, it's like a, you know, in a fairy tale kind of a thing, which you don't really find in several other cases. And it's about wonderful story about uh, the discovery of an etiological agent, which was originally, nobody had a clue that this could be a virus at all. And, with the help of these three people, now you know that it is a, a mysterious disease is caused by uh, an infectious agent and that to a virus. And then you know that uh, you identify the virus and you understand the, uh, you know, the properties of the virus, the preferences of the virus, and now also could actually develop drugs against them so that a lot of people were now saved. Because you know, I talked about the 170 million, approximately about 170 million people were infected, which was about to about 2% of the total population at one time. Now, if that was uncontrolled, there was no discovery of hepatitis C virus. And if that went uncontrolled, a large number of almost about a billion people would have been infected by this, of, of which a majority of the uh, population would have gone into developing liver cirrhosis or the, or the cancer. So their, their, their contribution has been enormous. And I, I, I can't uh, I can't disagree with the uh, uh, you know uh, selection of the by the jury, and this is no um, uh, no no sooner also. Anyway, this discovery has been I mean their discoveries has been having so much profound impact on the human life, and uh, I, I I I I would like to leave with this uh, this um, you know. Uh, uh, of sentences from a, a, a perspective written by Harvey. What he writes is this. My life has been a dream. The only problem is that it has not been my dream. I never dreamed about going into research. I never dreamed about discoveries or winning prestigious awards. These wonderful things were never in mind set. It just happened. So what he's talking about is that if you set your eyes on awards and other things, you probably don't, don't, don't end up being there. And that's, that also gives a strong message to us that we all, what we all have to do is that to be inspired uh, and uh, about what we have been doing. And then, uh, you know, our result is going to follow us. Success is going to follow us. Um, and uh, I can't actually uh, disagree with this at all. I mean, I totally agree with this. Um, and I would like to uh, stop here and then would like, uh, I can take some questions from the audience if there are. I hope I'm not, go I'm not late. And thank you all. Thank you, Krishnan, for this informative talk. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll be able to take one question now and then we'll move on to the other talks and then we'll get, ask the other questions at the end of the program. Uh, there's one question which has come through messages. It says, uh, uh, why was it not possible to replicate the hepatitis uh, C virus in labs? Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a very interesting question that we all kept asking, why, do they, why don't they replicate? At least one clue that uh, we uh, subsequently people knew are there, even though, so when the virus uh, enters the human body and then finds its way to liver, and then enters it, it finds a very beautiful niche inside the cell. For whatever reason, we were unable to provide that through the in vitro system in which we were culturing primarily uh, liver cancer cells, human liver cancer cells. 
right? Because the primary hepatocytes don't divide and then they are not actually a good system for infection in vitro. They have never been shown to be very successful. For whatever reasons that we do not understand, there's a big difference between in vivo and in vitro. And because of a various uh, set of factors, nobody was able to succeed and they required some kind of cell culture adaptation mutation that let people later identify. So once you, once you introduce these mutations, uh, a lot of these viruses are able to replicate. But, but in reality, in the infected person, the case, the sequences are quite different from what we do in the neurology. Thank you, uh, Krishnan. Uh, uh, we'll and shall I leave now? Yeah. Uh, we, if we have any, uh, any other questions, uh, would it be okay if we take it at the end of the program? Um, I would be having to go to my interview, so... Okay, okay. So if, uh, we'll then uh, get in touch with you later by email if it's possible. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. We will definitely okay. make sure that all the questions, whatever we receive okay. throughout the course of the program. Yeah, sure, we can pass it on. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank People, you. Uh, a wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the next, we'll move on to the next talk of this program. So this year's Nobel Prize in Physics was shared between mathematical physicist Roger Penrose and astronomers Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Geis for their contributions to the study of black holes. Our next speaker, Parmeshwaran Ajit, who is an astrophysicist at ICTSTIFR, is going to give an introduction to the physics and astrophysics of black holes, focusing on the Nobel laureate's contributions. So without further delay, over to you, Ajit. Thank you, Anishila. Uh, I'm very grateful for this uh, opportunity to talk to you today. And um, I'm going to switch to a new topic that has almost no significance to human life. Um, uh, still, black holes have captured the imagination of uh, a lot of us um, in a variety of, of different ways. And uh, this year's uh, Nobel Prize um, uh, was shared between uh, Roger Penrose, who is a mathematical physicist who established uh, some of the um, very rigorous proofs that, that black holes could exist uh, in the universe. And uh, two astronomers, uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Guess, who uh, led two teams of astronomers who uh, made some remarkable set of observations in the last 25 years that um, very conclusively established that there is um, a very massive and compact object at the center of our, our galaxy that is most likely to be a supermassive black hole that is weighing um, millions of times um, the mass of the sun. So uh, Roger Penrose's uh, Nobel citation was uh, for the discovery of that the black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity while uh, Gensel and Guess's uh, um, citation was for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. So um, as you know, um, black holes are among the most um, exotic and enigmatic objects that, that we know of. The existence of black holes was predicted by uh, the Albert Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity, which is the most accurate theory of gravity that we have right now. Uh, this is a very different picture, uh, and Einstein's theory presents a very different picture of gravity as uh, compared to where the familiar notion, uh, notion of, of Newtonian gravity. We know that um, Newton describes gravity as a force uh, that is proportional to the mass of the objects involved and is inversely proportional to the distance between these objects, etc. While uh, Einstein's uh, picture, gravity is a manifestation of the curvature of space and time. And any massive object like an apple or other forms of energy, also like electromagnetic energy, can produce a curvature of, on, on the space and time. And um, um, even more strangely, uh, in Einstein's theory, uh, space and time are not independent objects. They are part of a, a single entity called space-time. And um, uh, what we call space and what we call time depends entirely on the observer, according to Einstein's theory. While this sounds all uh, very exotic, the theory has been verified by a number of remarkable laboratory experiments as well as uh, um, astronomical observations. In fact, the theory has passed all the observational tests with flying colors. Um, basically, uh, Einstein's theory uh, uh, presents a geometrical theory of space-time, which also happens to be a theory of gravity. And uh, this is uh, the core of this theory is the set of equations which are written in a very compact form. 
uh, like this. These are called Einstein's equations. So the left part shows a quantity, a mathematical quantity, which describes the curvature of space time. And this is called Einstein tensor. And the right hand describes the matter content in the space time in the form of you know, mass, energy, momentum, et cetera. And this, you know, very famously, uh, John Wheeler, who is a famous uh, general relativist, put this. This equation tells how the so space time tells matter how to, how to move, and the matter tells um, space time how to curve. And both these aspects of, of, um, of, of uh, the, the curvature of space time, as well as the motion of, of objects in that curved space time, is encoded in this very compact set of equations. Although these equations are very compactly written, in practice, this sets a set of 10 uh, coupled nonlinear differential equations, which are notoriously hard to solve. In fact, still, there are only a handful of solutions exist for these um, Einstein's equations. But very interestingly, within, a month, uh, within months after Einstein published this, this theory, uh, another German astronomer or scientist, uh, physicist with a, a polymath, uh, Karl Schwarzschild published the first rigorous exact mathematical solution of the Einstein's equations. And it turns out that his uh, Schwarzschild solution describes the curvature of space time around a spherically symmetric object. And neither Schwarzschild nor Einstein you know, realized the, the, the physical importance of such an equation. Uh, they both are thought of this as a mathematical curiosity. But eventually, by studying uh, Schwarzschild's solution, mathematical relativists of the mid 20th century realized some very, very interesting things. One is that they realized that this solution encompasses a particular surface, uh, which is called a horizon. And um, if, if the space time encloses a particular mass, this short, you know, a mass which is called M, then this, this horizon is at, is at a radius called the Schwarzschild radius, which is equal to the two GM by C squared, where G is the Newton's constant of gravity and C is the speed of light. And this horizon contains a, you know, shows a very interesting property. Um, things can go only inside the horizon, but nothing can come outside the horizon, including light. And it turns out that uh, whatever things that fall into this horizon, including particles, TV sets, or, 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 or electromagnetic waves, or gravitational waves, whatever, they all fall through and reaches a central point, which is called a singularity. And the singularity is a very enigmatic point. And at this point, all known laws of physics break down. We cannot, we, we do not know how to describe singularities properly using any physical theories using, uh, of, of the current physics. Um, so, for example, um, um, the Schwarzschild radius, for example, that of the sun is about three kilometers. This means that if you are able to compress the sun into a radius of about three kilometers, this strange surface called this black hole horizon forms, and then not even light will be able to escape the surface and to reach the external observers. And another very interesting question that a lot of uh, mathematical physicists in the mid 20th century asked is that, can black holes exist in the physical world? Um, um, after all, the Schwarzschild solution is just a mathematical solution that describes a, set of solu a solution to a set of uh, equations. It, it is a well-defined solution, but does it have any physical significance? Do objects described by the Schwarzschild solution exist in the physical world? Can they exist in the physical world? And uh, this was um, answered by, uh, uh, this was a, a, a scene of a great controversy in the, in the, in the 1930s and, and, and the 40s. And this was uh, settled by a series of papers uh, at first. And um, I'll, 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 I'll discuss this, 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 this research, but it, the conclusion is that it turns out that massive stars, which are several times more massive than the sun, uh, can collapse at the end of their lives to form objects like black holes. And let me give you a quick uh, uh, 101 on the, on the theory of stellar evolution. And we know that, for example, stars are in equilibrium. Uh, their inward pull of the gravity is balanced by the pressure of the hot gas, as well as the light produced by the star, the pressure of the outgoing radiation. These two are in balance and they're in an equilibrium. But uh, at the end, once this nuclear fuel of the star exhausts, there is nothing to produce a pressure to balance the act of gravity and the gravity dominates 
and the star can collapse. And uh, depending on this, the mass of the original star, the final uh, object, the remnant object could be a different uh, types of compact object, like could be a black, uh, it could be a white dwarf or a neutron star or a black hole. And it turns out that, and in all these cases in, in white dwarfs and neutron stars, the pull of the gravity is balanced by other kinds of um, uh, pressures, which are called degeneracy pressure, which is a property of quantum mechanics. Uh, but it turns out that when the star is more massive than a certain number, about 10 times the mass of the sun, no other degeneracy pressures can support the inward pull of the gravity. And this core can only collapse and collapse into singularity forming a black hole. This was uh, first established by, um, you know, famously attributed to uh, a paper by Oppenheimer and Snyder in 1938 who showed that uh, a spherically symmetric um, uh, distribution of, of uh, dust would, uh, with appropriate conditions would collapse and form into a, form a black hole. And interestingly, it turns out that another Indian physicist called B. Dutt had published a very similar mathematical calculation a year ago, uh, but very little is known about him. His paper was sort of, um, um, was uh, not um, um, recognized until very recently, except for some very obscure citations in certain books. But it turns out that uh, this, this very enigmatic young person who died very soon after he published his paper also made a very similar contribution, uh, which is uh, famously attributed to Oppenheimer and Snyder. But the summary is that uh, when all thermonuclear sources of energy are exhausted, a sufficiently heavy star would collapse into a black hole. But even this uh, papers were um, uh, viewed with a lot of skepticism by the leading uh, physicists at the time. Uh, the reason was that they assumed certain very idealized conditions of things like you know, spherical symmetry, et cetera. And it was not clear whether uh, gravitational collapse or the actual stars in the physical world would um, obey such idealized conditions. And here comes Roger Penrose. Uh, in a paper that he published in 1964-65, uh, he showed that if you just assume some very basic uh, physical assumptions, uh, one could show using some very rigorous mathematical tools that he developed for, for this work, that a sufficiently massive object will collapse under its own gravity to form a singularity at the center. This is called a singularity theorem that is attributed to, that is, that is first proved by uh, Roger Penrose in, in 1965. And this basically set the, uh, the mathematical theory of black holes in a very, very rigorous footing. And this was you know, successively developed by, uh, by other people like uh, Hawking, uh, who proved a set of uh, very, very interesting theorems of, of singularities involving even the whole universe, you know, in the Big Bang singularities, et cetera. Um, uh, again, there is an interesting Indian connection. Uh, um, uh, Roger Penrose brought in a lot of very, very interesting mathematical tools, topological tools to prove this theorem. And also, uh, uh, based, you know, he, he used this calculation based on the so-called Raichaudhuri equation, which was developed by uh, A.K. Raichaudhuri, an Indian physicist who lived in Kolkata and taught in the Presidency College. Um, so there's an interesting Indian connection uh, here as well. So uh, people like Roger Penrose, the mathematical literates of the mid 20th century, were trying to answer the question, can black holes exist in the physical world? But now you can ask a very different question. Do black holes exist in the physical world? And this comes in the regime of uh, observational astronomy and, and experiment, et cetera, because this, this calls for empirical evidence. And, and starting from uh, 1960s, a, a variety of astronomical observations suggested that objects like black holes must exist in the universe. And the first clue came from the observation of very bright radio sources uh, called quasars, which seem to come from very, very distant universe, almost at the edges of the visible universe, billions of light years away. And these appear to be very, very bright and at the same time, very, very distant. So the only conclusion that these objects have to be intrinsically extremely bright. And people try to calculate or, or, or guess what kind of a, a, um, a processes would power such extremely luminous objects. And it turns out that the only thing that can power this kind of uh, luminosity is basically the gravitational potential energy 
released by infalling matter to black holes. This is the best explanation. Not, no other explanation, including nuclear physics, could, could come up with uh, this kind of um, uh, energy budget. Uh, just like these radio astronomers observe these extremely bright um, uh, objects at the very distant universe, uh, X-ray astronomers also found similar objects in a much you know, micro size called micro, black, uh, micro quasars from our own galaxy also. And here, again, the best explanation that these are uh, much smaller black holes, smaller black holes that are still you know, 10 times or, or several times more massive than the, uh, than the sun accreting gas from a companion star and these accreting gas gets heat up producing these x-rays while these quasars are believed to be powered by supermassive black holes which are millions of times as massive as the sun uh, another very interesting uh, arena for finding a black hole was our um, galactic center itself the center of our galaxy which is uh, which is known to be in the constellation called sagittarius in the southern hemisphere the left floor shows a, a cartoon picture of our galaxy. We cannot actually take an astronomical picture of our galaxy because we are in the galaxy itself. So, and uh, you can see the, our location. This is the sun is, is marked here and we around the sun is our solar system. But if you just see astronomers looked at this galactic center, which is the middle part of this, this spiral galaxy and the right plot is an actual astronomical photograph. And um, the center is marked by another yellow uh, square, and the this is known to astronomers for uh, almost a century that this is the galactic center, and people have found a very bright radio source, which is called Sagittarius A star. And starting from the 1990s, uh, a couple of teams of astronomers started measuring the motion of stars around the galactic center, and they have found something very very remarkable they found that uh, many stars are moving extremely fast around the galactic center. And in particular, some of the stars completed their orbital um, evolution, re orbital revolution within a matter of a decade or so. So this, 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 is, um, uh, uh, this is not an animation, it's actually an animation made by a large number of actual astronomical exposures taken by some of the best telescopes across the world and over a period of like 25 years, this particular uh, um, animation is due to the uh, UCLA group led by Andrea Guess. And you can see that many stars uh, have completed one orbital revolution during a period of 16 to 20 years. And, and many, many other stars are in the process of completing their orbital uh, revolutions around some unseen object, which is at the galactic center. And just like we can calculate the mass of the sun from the motion of planets, we can calculate the mass of the central unseen object from the motion of these stars. And using some very simple laws like some Newtonian uh, uh, physics. And when these astronomers did that, it turns out that the central object, central dark object has a mass of about 4 million solar masses, 4 million times the mass of the sun. So our galactic center has a dark secret that is extremely massive which we cannot see. And the only explanation that astronomers have is that our galaxy hosts a supermassive black hole. So this was a, a two defeat in the uh, observational astronomy because it's a very, very difficult measurement. It's a, because the galactic center is um, obscured by dust and it's very hard to observe these stars. And uh, these astronomers needed to go to near infrared wavelengths uh, to, to observe the stars. And they developed some very, very sophisticated technology like adaptive optics to, to make the precision measurement of the location of the stars using some uh, the most um, um, expensive and, 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 and you know, state-of-the-art telescopes uh, in the world like the Keck Observatory, as well as the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the European counterparts of, of these Keck Observatory. Uh, which is called, I forget the names. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the two teams of astronomers, uh, Reinhard Gensel of the Max Planck Institute and uh, Andrea Guess of the UCLA were awarded the Nobel Prize um, uh, for discovering this presence of this, this, this extremely massive and compact object at our galaxy center, uh, which is very, very likely to be a black hole. Um, I, I was uh, careful in, in in, in using that 
and you know, the, the, uh, even the Nobel Prize Committee was very careful in saying that they have, they have, you know, this is an extremely compact and massive object at the center of the galaxy, not a black hole, because we do not these these observations do not have the kind of power to tell whether these massive and compact objects at the center of our galaxy. Um, is it indeed a black hole or something that is more exotic that is could be as massive and 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 compact but recently many other astronomical observations are starting to probe the real nature of these 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 objects which we believe are black holes and the left plot shows an example of the first um, gravitational wave observation by the LIGO observatories which in 2015 discovered a gravitational wave signal produced by the collision of two black holes in a very, very distant galaxy about a billion light years ago uh, away. And uh, these observatories are still taking data. So far they have taken, uh, they have detected dozens of such signals from different black hole collisions happening at different parts of the universe. And these gravitational wave signals are starting to probe some real detailed nature of the actual nature of these, these, these compact objects, which we believe again are black holes. Uh, the right side shows, uh, shows a, the image of the, uh, the black hole at the center, supermassive black hole, the center of our neighboring galaxy, M87, which hosts another black hole about a billion times the mass of our sun. And this was taken by uh, a collaboration of radio telescopes called the Even Horizon Telescope. This was released last year. And uh, you can see that this dark shadow uh, in the, in this, among this luminous disk of, of, of matter, which is this infalling uh, gas producing um, uh, electromagnetic radiation. And while this gas is falling into this, this supermassive black hole. And for the first time, we are having a, really a shadow of, uh, of the region um, around the black hole a few times the, the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. A similar picture of, of the our galactic center black hole is expected from the same collaboration in a matter of uh, a month to a couple of years. And then we have much more conclusive evidence that what we are seeing, I, in, in the, in, what we have it at our galactic center is indeed a supermassive black hole. Let me uh, summarize now. Uh, uh, a quick summary is that uh, a variety of astronomical observations suggest the existence of massive and compact objects that are consistent with being black holes. However, the real smoking gun evidence of a black hole in general relativity, general relativity is the existence of singularities covered by a horizon. And we do not have any empirical evidence of either singularities or, or black hole horizons yet. But hopefully, we, in the next uh, decade or so, we will be getting the first evidence of, of the physics of this, you know, around the black hole horizons. Um, and astronomers also know that there are about you know, 10 million such stellar mass black hole like objects in our own galaxy. And these are like, likely to be produced by the collapse of massive stars. We also know that each galaxy hosts a supermassive black hole. Most of such you know, galaxies like ours host a supermassive black hole, each weighing uh, a few million times, uh, billions of times the mass of the sun. However, we do not know how nature is producing these supermassive black holes. There are some uh, theories, there are possible explanations, but none of them are fully satisfactory yet. There are some observational hints of medium-sized black holes, so-called intermediate mass black holes, that are in between the stellar mass black holes uh, and supermassive black holes. These, these intermediate mass black holes can be a few hundred times the mass of the sun. There are some very interesting theoretical predictions of what is called primordial black holes that can be extremely tiny as well. Uh, black holes can be as, as small as, as the earth or even smaller and could be very giants as well. And these are likely to be produced um, in the very early universe because of the quantum fluctuations at these highly dense parts of the, uh, in the early universe, some very high dense parts can form and they can collapse under their own self gravity producing uh, black hole, primordial black holes in the very early universe. This is a theoretical prediction, which is yet to be verified by astronomical observations. Black holes also offer a number of um, puzzles for theoretical physics. For example, we do not understand singularities. Uh, we do not know uh, how the information is lost uh, into black holes. This is a, is a very interesting puzzle called the black hole information paradox. Um, there are no 
um, there are arguments uh, explaining these ones, but there are no conclusive um, um, understanding of the, these puzzles yet. Uh, perhaps we will need a, need a quantum theory of gravity to explain these, these aspects of black holes. Uh, meanwhile, while theorists figure out the, these, these issues using theoretical calculations, astronomers also, um, you know, um, developing new tools for, for probing the real nature of this, these uh, extremely compact and massive objects that we know um, exist in the universe. Uh, so it's a very exciting um, time in the study of black holes where you know, a variety of uh, theoretical, mathematical, computational, as well as observational astronomy uh, approaches meet uh, to study uh, different aspects of this very, very exotic and very interesting uh, objects. So let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajit, for this really engaging talk. Uh, we have around seven, eight questions. <laughs> okay. But it, it, would it be okay for you if we ask one now and we visit the rest at the end of the program? Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just asking one question right now. Uh, what is the time scale over which the exhausted star turns into a black hole? Is it instantaneous? No, well, the... Um, Oh, the, the actual collapse, the, the, the stellar evolution happens over millions to billions of years. But the once the stars start to collapse, this can be uh, very, very, very short, short lived. Uh, it could, you know, the collapse can happen even time scales of um, uh, sub seconds for the case of um, massive stars. Okay, uh, so Ajit, we'll take the rest of the questions after the third talk. Sure. And, uh... For now, we'll move on to the third talk of the day. Uh, the next speaker is Sonal Nagarkar Jaiswal. She's a faculty at CCMB who is working in the field of neural development using Drosophila and human neuronal stem cells as a model system. Today, she's going to discuss the CRISPR-Cas9 system, a path-breaking genome editing technology developed by Jennifer A. Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. Now, I would like to request Sonal to please begin her talk. Thank you, Anishila. So today I'm going to tell you how um, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dodna's lab, they invented a new genome editing uh, technology that actually came from a basic research project. Uh, the technology is called CRISPR-Cas9 and it has revolutionized the whole genome editing field. So what is genome and what is genome editing? So genome is uh, the genetic material of an organism and it consists of DNA or RNA. And uh, the genome has, uh, could have a few hundred to hundreds of thousands of genes uh, in any organism. So, uh, so basically genes are uh, uh, long strands of DNA that are composed of nucleotides and that they carry codes that decide which protein should be expressed. So uh, for protein expression, so DNA uh, undergoes uh, two rounds and the first process is called transcription which give rise to a single strand molecule, which is called RNA. And RNA have these triplicate codes for different amino acids that upon translation form a long polypeptide chain and um, which then folds uh, three-dimensionally and give rise to different proteins. And uh, these different proteins are involved in uh, many different cellular processes. So, but then how, so as I told you that there are hundreds of thousands of genes. So how do we know which gene for which protein and uh, where is it involved? Like with the function of gene, how do we know? So the best way to find it out is basically we perturb the function of a gene and then look uh, for cellular processes that are affected. And that's how we find out its uh, function. So uh, what are mutations? Mutations are basically nothing, a single uh, base change uh, in a DNA, but you here I have an example. So, uh, or deletion of a base, which actually leads to uh, an abnormal or no protein formation, which perturbs the function of this gene. So for example, here I have this A, which was C, and now it is changed, which actually brings a premature stop codon here, and it leads to a truncated protein. So basically now we have this protein, which is truncated, it's not functional, and it will, not, uh, it will disrupt the cellular function. So how do we uh, know? So there are hundreds and thousands of genes. So how do we get these mutants for um, these all these genes? So uh, 
there are several efforts that uh, efforts had been made to find out or to basically generate mutants for uh, many genes. The first one started uh, with um, uh, the the first mutation were basically created by uh, a person. His name is Herman Joseph Muller in 1926, where he used X-ray uh, to generate uh, mutants of uh, small flies, fruit flies that are called Drosophila, and for which actually he got Nobel Prize in 1945. So, the, however, these mutations were not a single uh, deletions. There were large deletions and many large uh, chromosomal rearrangements. So then people turned and they were random. So people turned to uh, different things like chemical mutagens where uh, they use different mutagens like EMS and they fed animals and then screen for uh, mutations, random mutations. Then we also have uh, biological agents like transposon. So transposons are jumping genes. They basically hop from one chromosome or one genomic locus to another and thereby they create uh, uh, deletions or insertion mutations. And um, uh, this, uh, uh, this method also got a Nobel Prize. So uh, Barbara McClintock actually discovered jumping gene for the first time and she got Nobel Prize in 1983. So however, all these methods, they generate mutations, but they are random mutations. And to find out what is the precise location of mutation, we'll have to do DNA sequencing or uh, uh, different uh, complementation analysis to figure out where the mutation is and which gene is affected. So um, uh, in the same line, there, is, uh, there was one method which, uh, which came out and that is uh, RNA interference. So RNA interference is, uh, in RNA interference, we can actually target a single RNA molecule that, for a specific gene and uh, which will lead to degradation of this RNA and there will be no protein produced. So which will again impair the function of this gene. So this RNAi method, it was uh, again um, uh, got a Nobel Prize. So Andrew Fire and Craig Mello, they developed it and then they got Nobel Prize in 2006. So we can already see back to back, you know, our desire to understand and learn how gene function that lead to so, led to so many great discoveries and it is still continuing. So in the same line, then there were new methods were developed and these are the genome editing nucleases. Uh, mega nucleases, zinc finger nucleases, and talons. These uh, were much better than uh, the previous methods because they could actually still do uh, very close to the desired area where we want to do mu uh, create mutation. However, these are protein-based uh, methods that actually uh, applies uh, protein uh, domains that actually interact to a specific DNA region. So, therefore, the problem here is though we can make a desired mutation or close to desired point, we'll have to do a lot of protein engineering. First, we'll have to detect the sequences that actually we can use uh, for uh, protein binding. Then we'll have to engineer proteins according to those sequences, and then uh, they will create these breaks. So while we were working on these, you know, using these methods to create mutations uh, for uh, different genes, there were four groups, they were actually working or they were developing a, a very cool technology, which is called CRISPR-Cas9, uh, basically a, a tool for rewriting the code of life. So these four groups are were in four different places, the, uh, Jennifer Dunat's group, Emmanuel Charpentier's group, uh, Virginia's uh, Sixnik's group, and Peng Jen's group. So all these groups were independently, independently working on the system, which is called CRISPR-Cas9 system, that got the the Nobel Prize this year. Uh, so for, for that, Jennifer and uh, Emmanuel got uh, the Nobel Prize this year. So what is this CRISPR-Cas9? The CRISPR-Cas9, so let me tell you what it, uh, what it is first, and then we'll see how they used it. So the CRISPR-Cas9 system is basically found, uh, was found or is found in bacteria or archaea. It has three major components. The first component is the CRISPR loci, which you can see here. This CRISPR loci has several um, palindromic repeats. They are uh, present in a cluster and they are spaced or separated by small random spacer sequences. And then uh, the, there is a, a leader sequence that is present, present just before uh, these uh, locus. This leader sequence contains a promoter that actually helps in transcription of the an expression of this CRISPR loci. Then second component that we have is 
Cas9 gene cluster. So Cas9 gene cluster, there are one to 10 known, depending on which uh, different organisms, there are different Cas9s. And these Cas9 uh, genes uh, express Cas proteins that actually help uh, bacteria in fighting uh, viruses and fields. And the third component that we have is tracer RNA, which actually helps in uh, processing of uh, CRISPR RNA uh, that is produced from CRISPR locus. So these are the three component system. So how, uh, let's just go to uh, briefly see where and when they were identified and described. So the first time the CRISPR locus was detected in E. coli by Ishino's group in 1987. However, he didn't know what these sequences are and what were they doing in bacteria. So uh, then in 1993, Francisco Mojica actually discovered, he analyzed his short, uh, short uh, DNA fragments and found that they, these repeats are present even in archaea. Then he, he got fascinated with this and he wanted to find out what these are. So he actually started working and he started analyzing different molecular microbes and found in most of like in about 20 different uh, microbes, including uh, microbacterium and plague uh, bacteria. They, he found that these CRISPR loci was present. However, the sequence were random and different. They were not conserved. Then um, while the, he was working uh, on finding these sequences, another person, um, Jensen, he discovered that there is a CRISPR cluster, which is just before the CRISPR loci. And he, he found there were four uh, genes, Cas1, to Cas, Cas1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, Cas protein gene. However, he couldn't uh, uncover the, you know, the uh, function of these genes. Then um, uh, again in 2005, Pohika, uh, one now and Bolotin's group discovered independently that the CRISPR locus actually contain part of uh, the, the, the random spaces that are there. These random spaces are actually part of genetic material of uh, phages that uh, or viruses that infect bacteria. Then in 2006 for the first time, uh, Marakova showed that there is a protein called Cas9, which is actually actively uh, involved in a uh, bacterial immune system. However, he couldn't uh, pinpoint the, the molecular function of this protein. So finally in 2007, uh, Barangao uh, actually experimentally showed that the CRISPR Cas9 system is uh, uh, an adaptive uh, uh, immune system in bacteria and archaea. So what he did, basically he deleted the CRISPR locus and then found that uh, these bacteria are actually uh, susceptible for uh, two uh, bacteriophage infections. And uh, finally, in 2011, in, in Emmanuel Charpentier's lab discovered that uh, there is, apart from this CRISPR RNA, there is another RNA, which is called tracer RNA. That RNA is required and uh, for processing of this CRISPR RNA. So if you don't have this tracer RNA, somehow the CRISPR RNA is not able to defend the, 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 the infection from phases and viruses. And in, in 2012, the, the uh, Carpentier's group and Jordan's group, they worked together. And independently, a uh, six mix group also uh, work on the similar uh, thing. And then the Carpentier and Jordan for the first time showed that uh, it's the tracer RNA, which is it, which it actually forms a complex with the CRISPR RNA and together stabilize, these two together stabilizes the Cas9 nucleus uh, on, uh, with them which actually then creates a double standard break in, uh, uh, in DNA. So this was the first time, uh, this was the discovery for the first time by Charpentier and Dodna. However, since uh, Sixnik also came up with a similar um, study or similar result, but he was, uh, his paper came out uh, about uh, a month uh, after uh, Charpentier and Dodna. And then in 2013, January, for the first time, Feng Jing used the system to uh, edit uh, mammalian genome, basically. So this is all about uh, CRISPR, uh, you know, discovery and all. So how does it work actually? So, uh, sorry. So, um, yeah. So now we can see that a, a lot of uh, more than 50 modern organisms actually use CRISPR and Cas9 system for gene editing. And you can see here that from 2012, when there's these three things, three, four things came out. And now if you compare, there is a huge increase in 
uh, publications uh, that actually use uh, this system for various uh, different model system and they have developed many different uh, other techniques based on CRISPR Cas9. And actually the, the paper, uh, Kakin Charpentier's and uh, Jennifer's paper was actually is cited almost about 4,000 times since then. So it's all about now CRISPR, how does it work? What is CRISPR Cas9 and how does it work? So CRISPR Cas9, as I told you that it's an adaptive immune system response from bacteria, bacteria from bacteria toward bacteriophage. So what happens? So in a prokaryotic cell, when there is a phase infection, what happens? There are two proteins that are expressed, Cas1 and Cas9. They will go and detect this foreign DNA and they will find and look for one specific motif, which is called protospacer adjacent motif. This is, it is NGG. So Cas1 and Cas9, they recognize this motif and then they bind to this foreign DNA and then they start chopping this DNA. And then they grab small pieces of this foreign DNA and then they insert it in CRISPR locus between the two palindromic repeats. So these palindromic repeats uh, here, what we showed that they are actually these the pieces are from different bacteria or different bacteriophages and viruses. Now, once it is done, if there is another attack from this bacteriophage, what happens? CRISPR locus is transcribed where you have a long uh, RNA, but as I said, this repeat is palindromic. This will form a hairpin loop. So now we have one hairpin loop and one spacer, another hairpin and another spacer. So this is how a pre-CRISPR RNA is transcribed. And then other components of Cas9, Cas9 1 to 6, depending on which uh, bacteria it is, it will process this CRISPR RNA into small, uh, pre-CRISPR RNA into small CRISPR RNA. Now this small CRISPR RNA is being made and at another locus where we have tracer RNA locus, tracer RNA will be transcribed, which will travel and then uh, another Cas9 protein is expressed. So this uh, is an aspirogen. That's what, uh, uh, in, depending on other bacteria, there are different uh, complexes of Cas9s. So Cas9 or other uh, uh, six, eight or 10 Cas comp complex, it is expressed. That together with, so CRISPR RNA together with the tracer RNA forms a complex, a stable complex. So that Cas9 then recognizes and binds to it and then they go and bind to target sequence based on the sequence similarity we have here. And then, then CRISPR is activated and it creates a double, double standard break, uh, break and degrades this phage DNA. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the system. So here what uh, Jennifer and Emmanuel's lab uh, finally uh, found is that tracer RNA is, is uh, important for this complex formation and Cas9 actually depends on this complex to stabilize, get stabilized on the DNA, uh, phase DNA, and create a double standard break. All right. So this is how uh, the CRISPR system works uh, in in the basically bacteria. So then, when they were doing this, that they, they thought, how can we use the system outside of bacteria to perform genome editing? So what the day they started looking. Um, uh, they started doing in vitro experiments where what they did is they created, they expressed, uh, in, they brought uh, Cas9 and then a CRISPR RNA, which has complementary sequence to a target RNA that they wanted to degrade or cut. Uh, and then um, a tracer RNA, which has nice uh, binding to the CRISPR RNA. So when they bring these three components together, Cas9 was able to degrade uh, or cleave, sorry, make a double standard break, break in DNA. So this was a three component system. Then they modified it and brought a uh, two component system where what they did is Cas9 is same. They fused these two um, RNAs, CRISPR RNA and tracer, and they created one single um, uh, CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA chimera, which we call guide RNA. So then they created this um, 
two component system and perform in, in vitro experiment and show that it works. So I'll just show you one piece of data from this paper where what they did here is they took a plasmid. There is, um, they have the GFP, GFP here and they created five, four different, uh, five different probes or guide RNA, chimeric guide RNA with uh, close to PAM site and they perform an experiment where they selected one restriction enzyme which will digest upstream of this site and then guide RNA. They perform in vitro reaction, uh, interaction uh, reaction together with Cas9 and they found that each and uh, every reaction actually gave rise to this small fragment that they expect like digest with sal1 and there was another cut with the cas9 and they could do it in vitro so this gave them confidence that um, this can be used the system can be used in many different uh, model organisms and today what we do is we use the same strategy where we have the two component system that was developed by them in any model organism what we do is we designed a guide RNA which is complementary to the target RNA wherever we want to create a mutation. So we have a PAM sequence and then close to PAM we will select our guide RNA sequence and then this is one component where uh, and, and then the Cas9 is another component and then we express both of these things in different model organisms and then it will create a double standard break. So what happens after double standard break? We once the double standard break is made the cells can repair it into two ways. First is non-homologous enjoining, where it will create small indel mutations, deletion or um, a smaller little large deletion. And then all the other ways that we provide a template, DNA template, where we can give homology sequences and then get whatever the, the uh, any DNA that we want to get inserted in this. So this way we can pre basically tag any gene or create single, small or large deletions or totally change the uh, gene sequence. Okay, so this is how uh, it works uh, in genome disruption way or gene disruption way. But now Cas9 Cas, uh, Cas CRISPR system is being used for many other things, not just only for creating double standard break, like what we uh, what we saw here. It is also being used for controlling or for checking uh, gene expression or controlling gene expression. What uh, they uh, did is basically what here you can do is uh, fuse a Cas9 uh, enzyme with or transcription regulator, and you can decide on a uh, and a you can decide where you want to uh, uh, bring this transactivator. You will decide the guide RNA according to that, and then which can actually affect the expression of this gene. Another uh, thing which is developed based on the CRISPR-Cas9 system is uh, epigenetic modification, which was not possible before. So again, here with the help of guide RNA, you can uh, stabilize this uh, complex here. And in this case, uh, Cas9 is fused to it and epigenetic modifier, a domain that is involved in epigenetic modification. That's how you can actually bring these changes close to the target site. Then we can also uh, uh, look at RNA, uh, you know, monitor RNA. And for that, uh, we will basically, so in these two cases, what we do is we do not uh, we use uh, Cas9, which has, uh, which is nucleus uh, dead because here we want to create a double standard break, but here in this case, we do not want to create a double standard break. So we just utilize the, the part or the, uh, the property that is actually binding to this complex. Then we have RNA targeting again in the same way, we have a uh, nucleus dead uh, either Cas9 or there is another Cas protein which is being used is Cas13. So uh, what you do is basically you target RNA and again, either the, um, Cas9 will have a fluorescent, uh, fluorescent probe uh, that you can monitor or the, the somehow these small RNAs are modified. So they carry certain um, motifs that can bind to different fluorophores. And this is how you can modify or you can uh, monitor RNA uh, trafficking. Then we have a new uh, uh, um, method that uh, was again developed on CRISPR-Cas9, which is uh, to change the chromatin topology. 
So, um, chromatin topology changing, you, normally you cannot do it. Uh, so far, I didn't see any uh, system that does it very uh, like this precisely. So, what here they did is that two proteins, they interact with each other and they will bind to different sites. So, this way you can bring promoter and enhancer. So, basically bring two components that are far away from each other. You bring them together so that now promoter and enhancer, they can interact with each other and then you can um, look at the gene expression profiling. Okay, so this was all about uh, uh, all these methods that are CRISPR-Cas dependent and they are involved in basic, we use them in basic understanding basic biology. But apart from basic biology, we actually have uh, more uh, for CRISPR-Cas9. So people have used CRISPR uh, system for crop improvement. More than 20 crops have been, you know, uh, in, in more than 20 crops, uh, people have used CRISPR-Cas9 system to modify these to basically fight with the uh, viruses and uh, uh, mold infection or uh, to uh, basically fight with the uh, uh, drought or uh, salinity problems. So, uh, so far, these are all experimental in laboratory. However, there are three cases like the maize, where is the vex uh, corn and for soya bean and butter mushrooms. Uh, these three have been approved. So that there are changes. Uh, and then they have been approved by, uh, at least in USA, they are at, uh, at the large production. They will come out in market soon. And apart from this, we also have CRISPR in medicine. So in diagnostics, uh, there are kits that were based on CRISPR-Cas9 interaction. So there are kits for Zika virus and uh, MRSA, dengue virus and uh, African swine flu virus and also COVID. And one of the COVID kit is actually developed uh, in one of the CSIR laboratories, uh, which is ICGB, I, sorry, IGIB in Delhi. So apart from diagnostics, uh, people are trying to use CRISPR-Cas9 in curing diseases also. Uh, for uh, There are clinical trials going on for sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, and uh, a rare eye disease, which is uh, LCA10, and also for uh, cancers. So we can see already that, you know, uh, CRISPR is involved in not only in the basic biology or important, not only in basic biology, but also in uh, crops and medicine. So overall, CRISPR system has taken our life sciences into a new epoch. And in, it is actually in many ways bringing great benefit to humankind. So I would say that uh, it is uh, one of the best uh, discoveries uh, in the um, uh, this field, you know, editing field so far. And I am sure that we, uh, almost everybody is using this system. All right. With this, I would like to finish. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonal, for this informative talk, giving us an overview of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, there's a question which we have got from uh, messages. Uh, the gene editing using CRISPR technique seems like a magic wand. Uh, is there a way forward to uh, provide solutions to cure genetic diseases? And what is the way forward for human gene editing that is in line with laws drawn by scientists and governments? So actually people are trying um, uh, human gene editing. There are uh, basically four different studies where actually uh, people tried uh, for in human embryos for changing, you know, genetic, for changing the different genes. So far it is, it was not, uh, you know, it's not uh, great because CRISPR-Cas9 also bring one problem that is of target effects. So there were, uh, it, when, when these people uh, looked at um, uh, embryos after uh, gene editing, they found there were mutations and there were arrangements in many different uh, other loci. So for that, uh, they are developing, like there are, there are people, like scientists who are developing uh, modified, uh, you know, versions of uh, Cas proteins that actually have less ta of targets. So it's, it's going on for, as I said, clinical trials for four different studies are like four different diseases are going on. So we'll see in future. Uh -huh. okay. uh, is CRISPR going to uh, push us in a fast paced evolution mode? This is another question which has come through messages. Can you repeat it? Uh, is CRISPR going to push us in a fast-paced evolution mode? Fast-paced evolution mode. Uh, well, it depends on us. If we control things, um, then no. <laughs> There's also another question which we have just received on YouTube. 
are there any limitations for this technique can it be done on fetuses so fetuses okay there is one um, study or one one case that was reported by a chinese uh, group scientists they actually tried crispr uh, experiment on uh, human uh, uh, embryos and then uh, actually the two kids are already born so what they did is they deleted one gene that actually lets uh, hiv virus enter cell and uh, but so far we do not know because they didn't look at what were the you know side effects of these so i don't think uh, we are going to do it in new near future as i said there are other uh, three studies where they found large deletions and large arrangement uh, rearrangements so i i don't think it is uh, going to be very soon that we can start uh, experimenting on human especially uh, fetus sorry yeah especially yes. fetus because it changes everything localized effect is one thing but here you know the whole organism is developing from that fetus so it will change a lot of different things Uh, there's another question uh, how is the guide rna created so guide rna so what we do basically we um, like normal pcr uh, you uh, get the sequence you analyze the sequence you find the locus where you want to make change and then there is the dna sequence you actually get complementary of that that sequence you can order you can get it synthesized from uh, companies so there are ways you can simply uh, you know get those okay thank you so much sonal uh, for uh, this talk and answering so many questions which had come through both youtube and messages uh, if there are any other questions which we receive later uh, we would be uh, i mean we would be happy to uh, send it to you and then maybe uh, share it with whoever has asked the questions sure. uh, and thank you so much for your time thank you Uh, and now we will move on to some other questions which are still left uh, may i request uh, ajit to take some questions which we have received uh, for his talk on black holes sure so uh, have astronomers made any observations which do not agree with the general theory of relativity mm-hmm. it's an interesting question uh, there were some puzzling um, uh, observations one was uh, an observation made by the pioneer tele- uh, uh, satellite but it it turns out that this could be explained by an experimental uh, error so so far all such um, observations that um, suggested deviations or violations of of general relativity it could be tracked to um, experimental or observation errors so far there is no conclusive evidence that require any modification of gr there is um, there is this puzzling observation that the universe is expanding at a phase at the at a, at a, at a speed um, at a pace that is faster than that is predicted by uh, our known matter content in the universe but the most popular explanation of that is that there is some unknown form of energy called vacuum energy or dark energy that we do not know yet uh, some uh, people also try to explain this uh, by saying that by arguing that the gr general relativity gets modified at very large scales of scales of cosmology but i would say there is no conclusive evidence that suggests that gr needs to be modified so there's the uh, there's another question uh, can these supermassive black holes act as seeds for galaxy formation uh um uh, it, it seems that uh, supermassive black black holes seems to play a major role in the formation and evolution of galaxies uh but are you suggesting that the the stars assemble themselves around supermassive black holes that is unlikely uh because um uh, if you know you want if you want to produce black holes you want to start with some stars um so uh, i don't think um supermassive black holes are playing a role of seeding galaxies but they are they seem to be high. so for example there is a very interesting observed relation that the mass of the galaxies is highly correlated with the mass of the central supermassive black hole uh so there is some empirical evidence that suggests that supermassive black holes are playing a major role in the evolution of galaxies but the details are not very clear and admittedly i am not an expert in this topic as well 
uh, there's another question uh, about uh, what is the lifespan of a black hole? Will they live on forever or they end up transforming into something else? Yeah, so according to classical theory of physics, classical theory of gravity, black holes will live forever. But if you take into account some quantum mechanical um, calculations, which are very hard to do because you don't have a fully uh, quantum theory of gravity yet, uh, but one person or a few people, uh, uh, notably Hawking and uh, Beck Einstein, tried to uh, do a semi-classical calculation, which is you know, bringing some aspects of quantum mechanics to the calculation of black holes. They found that black holes can actually radiate some energy outside, which is, the, which is against the popular notion of, uh, of, of black holes. And in that case, black holes can actually lose energy and kind of disappear. But it turns out that uh, you know, the, the amount of Hawking radiation is inversely proportional to the mass, the large power of the mass of black holes. So for um, the black hole that we actually observe in nature, the astrophysical black holes, the Hawking radiation is completely negligible. But if there are some extremely tiny black holes, like the kind of primordial black hole that could have formed in the early universe, some of those very light primordial black holes could have completely disappeared by evaporating into Hawking, you know, by, by emitting Hawking radiation. So there's uh, another question. Uh, what is the big next big thing in observational astronomy after gravitational waves and James Webb telescope? That's a very hard thing to say, and it's probably a matter of taste and an interest and an exposure. Um, there are lots of interesting things coming up. Um, one is that you know the horizon of of astronomy is is um, uh, increasing significantly. It started with optical light; it went through uh, the full electromagnetic spectrum, neutrinos and cosmic rays started coming, now gravitational waves. So the, you know, the people are starting to use different messengers to probe uh, the cosmos and, and they all probe very different aspects of the astrophysical phenomena. And each of these, uh, these messengers, people are you know, pushing the frontiers, both in neutrinos, astrophysical neutrinos, gravitational waves, X-rays or cosmic microwave background observations. Um, transient astronomy is another big field that is using optical telescopes. But earlier, people were um, used to observing the sky as a static object. But we know that there are a lot of things that are changing. There are transient phenomena in astronomy, in, in, in the cosmos. Uh, there is a huge amount of attention going to the study of this transient phenomena, like exploding stars, GRBs, and, and so on. There are large radio telescopes coming up, like the Square Kilometer Array which would um, probe a number of interesting things. One, one is, um, one is, is um, you know, probing the so-called dark ages. And there is, for example, some observational gap uh, in the probes of the universe um, you know, before the formation of first stars and after the observation of what is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. So there are, um, there are proposed extra telescopes um, there are improvements on the neutrino telescopes like Ice Cube proposed. So there is a, a variety of interesting things happening in, in astronomy, observational astronomy. So you can pick your favorite. <laughs> Next question. Uh, Einstein's equations can predict black holes, but why can they not predict what happens after that? Uh, what happens after that, you mean? Um, after is some reference to time or you mean what happens the, at the interior singularity of the black holes? I'm guess I'll just I'm guessing it's the latter, but I can confirm from the right. It, it turns out that you know uh, if you're talking about a singularity, it, it turns out that you know these Einstein's equations actually um, uh, encounter a singularity, which means that you cannot solve them at that point. So a lot of people believe that there has to be some substructure, some kind of a quantum phenomena that would resolve that singularity. And uh, since Einstein's equations are coming from a classical theory of gravity, they have no notion of quantum mechanics, no qu quantum physics. So you have to have a quantum theory of gravity to describe what is happening in this very small region. And there are many candidate theories, and uh, but all of them are uh, in the works. There's one last question. How does the ground-based telescopes using adaptive optics compares to the space telescope where atmospheric disturbance is absent as a whole? 
That's a very good question. So, uh, you know, even if you use adaptive optics, the you know the best that you can get is uh, is to the quality of space telescopes because the space telescopes don't have to deal with atmosphere. But where the uh, ground-based telescopes have an advantage over space telescopes is because of their larger collecting area. You know, you can build a much larger telescope the same price as, as, a, as a space telescope. And it's very hard, it's much more expensive to launch a very large space telescope um, um, you know, to space. For example, Hubble has a diameter of a meter or two, while even the current uh, telescopes like um, Keck and the VLT, very large telescopes, has diameters of you know, 10 meters or so. And there are plans of building 30 meter telescopes and 40 meter telescopes, et cetera, because these are much more cost effective. So, so the summary is that the ground-based telescopes have the advantage of the larger collecting area, while the space-based telescopes have the advantage of no atmosphere. Okay, so I think we we don't have any other questions about uh, from any other topics yet. So I think we'll uh, we'll bring this program to a close now. I'd like to thank all the speakers for their time and for giving such wonderful talks today. And also a big thank you to the audience for attending this session. Uh, we hope to see you in the next Saval Jawab that is on November 21st, where Ullas Kolthur is going to talk about uh, when, what, and how much to eat. So once again, uh, I thank the speakers and the audience uh, for, for, for the speakers for giving the talks and the audience for attending and participating in this program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening thank and thank you, you for organizing.